One of the biggest problems in the world, from my point of view, is the fact that most lower or middle, low middle income countries are way, way, way behind their OECD counterparts in terms of learning in the same grade. So if you evaluate 15 year olds in an OECD country and 15 year olds in a typical low income country, it's not like they're mildly different, they're just worlds apart. And uh, according to some recent research that I've done, roughly half of developing country young adult women who have completed grade six, but no higher, so stopped at grade six, can't read a single sentence. So it's not like they're not functionally literate, it's not like they can't read for content, they can't read a single four word farming is hard work sentence. So um, the learning profiles, which is just a simple descriptive relationship between your acquisition of skills and your duration of time in school are way, just way too shallow. You don't learn enough per year of schooling to emerge from schooling even moderately prepared for the challenges you will face as an adult. And the problem is, if you want to find an uneducated child, the only place to find them is in school. So if you look at decomposition of like who can't perform uh, simple uh, mathematics, in South Africa, who's illiterate age 12, only 3% of those who are illiterate age 12 never aren't in school, whereas 28% of kids are illiterate. So the vast majority of illiterate kids are kids who are in school. So the only place to find an uneducated kid is in school. And I want to emphasize that this isn't a problem of the poor. Um, <clears throat> it's not an inequality problem, it's a crappy system problem. So if you look at the fraction of kids in, in, or the fraction of adults who on the standard PISA assessment perform at levels four, five, or six, that's about 27, 28% of kids in the UK, 40 to 50% of Korea, kids in Korea, and 1.6% of kids in Indonesia. So, which means, if you regard the statistical elite as being the top 5% of the country, most of the top 5% of the country aren't in anything like a globally competitive position in terms of their education. Because after all, <laughs> even if all of the 1.6 getting it were from the top 5%, it's still less than half of the top 5% are getting a globally adequate education. So it's globally inadequate across the board. The whole distribution is shifted down. Um, and Jakartans, who are, you know, people in the city of Jakarta, relative to the high school dropout in the OECD, have about the same adult functional literacy. So, again, the elite, those that are in the capital city with a university degree, have roughly the same adult literacy competency as measured by the OECD as the typical high school dropout in an OECD country and in a high performing country like Japan, the high school dropouts have much higher literacy than the college graduates in Indonesia. Then you would ask yourself, okay, knowing what we know to motivate that systems are crappy, the place find an educated kid is in school, there's wide variation across schools in the extent to which they reach the basics, meaning that if you look back at this graph, what's striking about this graph is the learning level of kids who completed grade six goes from roughly zero to roughly 100. So grade six doesn't mean anything, meaning grade six is unpredictive of whether or not you'll be literate. And the variation across countries is as wide as, as it could be. Meaning what's the maximum variation we could have? Well, zero to 100% of the population reading. That's roughly the variation we have because I'm only showing you five of the 50 countries. The lowest country is 3%. So the lowest country is three, the highest is 97. So it's not as if we don't have differential. Um, <clears throat> the average is about two to standard deviation below the OECD. And by the way, Vietnam is exactly at OECD level. So we have instances of countries in the lower and middle income country performing at the level of the OECD. And even the statistical elite, not the Ambani wedding elite, but the statistical elite of the top 1% or 5% are also getting a globally at best mediocre education. Really a globally crappy education, but at best mediocre. So, okay. 
We need to learn about learning. If we want to improve learning, we have to learn about it. Um, <clears throat> and the kind of first generation randomista claim was that significantly more funding of independent impact evaluations using techniques of randomized control trials will lead to significant improvements in the development process, better policies, programs, and projects that will lead to higher human well-being. This was kind of the claim that was made. This was a kind of claim, notice that this isn't a claim about how to get a journal article published. If this were just a claim about how to get a journal article published, there's a different set of discussion. It, this was an evidence action impact claim, right? But that claim was always a complete black box, fleshing out what is in fact the actual causal claims that one would make to make and you know, verify as a valid claim that more of this type of research would lead to more improvements in actual outcomes is a complex set of claims. And my claim is that the RCT is IIE kind of randomista 1.0 log frame, meaning what's the logical framework or what's the complete coherent causal chain leading from doing more RCT research to better outcomes, involves six different claims and five of them are false. The first claim is that RCTs can be generated about highly consequential actions. Uh, and I think, A, that's false. RCTs can only be generated if you can generate treatment and control and national development and national processes have a hard time generating a control group. B, le actually lead to feasible large scale, scale innovations. My argument is this is mostly false because the efficacy of policies, programs, and projects is mostly limited by capability, not knowledge. Lee either is already in regions of political support or changes the political port sufficient to authorize action. I would argue that's also false. There's no particular evidence that politicians are more likely to do something because it's based on RCT evidence than other forms of evidence, unless they already wanted to do it. But the idea that there's significant changes in the political supportability in and of because we've done a particular kind of evidence is mostly false. That evidence has to be of sufficient construct validity to guide action, meaning we have to be able to extrapolate from one study to other conditions not just other, to, and I want to distinguish these two things and I'll get to this in a second, but we have to be able to extrapolate beyond what was exactly what was done. Suppose I did teacher training of this type with these resources of, in this subject and found it was efficacious. If I don't have any way to guide what other types of things would be efficacious, that's not very helpful. If I did teacher training in mathematics and it worked, but teacher training in reading doesn't and teacher training in science doesn't, then the concept of teacher training doesn't have what I call construct validity. I'm not talking about a homogeneous entity, a homogeneous kind of thing for which one can aggregate and accumulate evidence. And so mostly response surfaces are super rugged over a high dimensional design space that undermines any claim to construct validity. Fifth, you have to claim there's sufficient external validity in order for the studies to be amortized so that we can accumulate knowledge that transports across contexts because otherwise I need a study of every single thing I'm going to do in every single context and we can't do that. So the idea that a randomized trial, controlled trial study is particularly valuable depends deeply on claims about external validity. Because without claims on external validity, it's not particularly valuable. Or as I put it sometimes, rigorous evidence isn't. The rigorous evidence is only rigorous about exactly the context in which it was done. Without claims or knowledge of external validity, rigorous evidence isn't. You can't say, I'm relying on rigorous evidence from Nepal to do this in India. Because once it gets transported across context, it's no longer rigorous. It's no more rigorous than anything else in ways that I'll explore. Um, and then <laughs> the one claim that was true is that 
randomized control trials were superior to other evaluation methods in identifying causal impacts. <laughs> Which, by the way, everybody knew. Like, I worked in the World Bank. No one was confused about this point in 1995. Like, nobody in the World Bank thought before and after was a reliable indicator of with and without. Like, <laughs> we weren't stupid, right? Um, we may have been lots of things, but we weren't stupid. So this point was true, but always known to be true, um, <clears throat> and hence wasn't really a big innovation. So as, as, <clears throat> as the type of research that ought to be done in order to learn about learning in a way that it would improve learning, I would argue the RCTs have nothing, nothing, nothing going for them. All of the claims that would need to be made to actually have a positive model in which RCTs create useful and used knowledge that will improve outcomes at scale and of magnitude are false. So, um, in my mo point, <laughs> in 2018, the debate is over. The RCT people lost the debate completely and won a Nobel Prize. <laughs> How they did that, kind of an interesting story. But <clears throat> let me sort of walk through why I think on these five dimensions, the debate that the position that the advocates of RCTs needed to maintain, not to maintain claims about what would generate a journal article, but to maintain claims about what would in fact be efficacious in promoting higher learning outcomes in the world were false. Um, so uh, let's just <clears throat> start with, I need to show you some graphs to illustrate kind of what I mean conceptually by a couple of these points. So first of all, the difficulty is, is that mostly what an RCT can evaluate is an instance of a class. So if you think of a, a car, a car is an abstract noun that represents a class of objects. Every specific car is an instance of the class of car. So your car is a car in the class of all cars, right? So the question is, can I make claims about cars versus claims about my car? And it kind of depends on how much heterogeneity and whether the construct of car has sufficient validity over the range of applications I'm talking about. So if I say a car can tow a large trailer, that depends on the car and hence depends on the specifics. And every, even in a super simple class, what, how you move from a class to an instantiation of the class is through a specification of the elements. Any given car has a type of engine, a type of transmission, certain numbers of doors, certain numbers of wheels and types of wheels and width of wheels, certain. And so in order to get from the class to an instance, you have to specify. And what you're specifying is the design space. So a car is a name for a design space of all cars, and a car is an instance in the design space. And I would argue even in, a, even in the simplest possible class of programs, like a conditional cash transfer, there are super numbers, large numbers of design elements. So, you know, when I say CCTs do X, it's like, okay, maybe, but any ECCT that's been evaluated is an instance of a CCT. So what I'm going to show you is graphs that are impossible to understand, but you'll come to love, um, in which we're going to think about the design space being in the two-dimensional space. So just imagine there's two design elements, and each of those design elements has choices. I'm giving a CCT. One dimension is the magnitude of the transfer. One dimension is what it's conditioned on and I have multiple choices in each design. And then I, over this design space, I have a response surface or a fitness function, which is if I were to implement this instance of a CCT, what would be the impact on the outcome of interest? Right? And that's kind of what an RC does, is it estimates a point on the response surface. <clears throat> but it estimates a point on the response surface not the response surface, because everything that is implemented is an instance. It doesn't say, here is the towing capacity of cars. It says, here is the towing capacity of this car. 
and the towing capacity of another car might be 10 times as large because it's a different design. Now, once we have in mind a response surface over a design space, we can think, we can like be precise about what we mean by two different things. One is, um, we can think that there's something called context, and there's context A, and there's context B, and that this is a design space of teacher training programs that has two elements with six possible choices. So any given teacher training program is one of 36 possible designs. And it could be that no matter how we design it in context A, it works, and no matter how we design it in context B, it doesn't work. In which case we have a problem of external validity, because if we take evidence of the efficacy of the program from A to B, we will not predict correctly the impact in B, and vice versa. So that's external validity, and external validity is across context, even for the same design. But there's also a second, I think, incredibly more serious problem, um, which is construct validity. Here I sort of assumed that the response surface looked like Kansas, that the outcome of what we did was relatively robust with respect to the design, but there's no reason to believe that's true. <laughs> uh, there's no reason to believe anything about this response surface ex ante, because kind of that's what a theory gives us, and the idea is we're doing things theory free. So there's no reason ex ante to have any particular prior beliefs about how rugged this fitness function should be. So it could well be that design matters a lot. Instead of looking like Kansas, it looks like the Himalayas. And some project, project designs, so then we could think of different classes of programs. And this is a class of programs called teacher training. And it could well be if we design teacher training such that design element one is choice three, it never works. But really locally proximate designs work a lot. So if we were to do an RCT of that design, it would say teacher training doesn't work. If we did an impact evaluation of that design, it would say teacher training works really well. Versus, again, we could have another class of programs called textbook provision. And again, textbook provision, the impact of providing additional textbook for learners could be highly contingent on the design of the ways in which the textbooks themselves were designed, the ways in the textbooks were used pedagogically. Now, Construct validity means <clears throat> um, we can't really necessarily aggregate evidence. So let's say I've done a randomized controlled trial of 10 different teacher training programs. I've evaluated the height of the Himalayas in 10 different places. Without a specification of where those places were, I have no idea. Because I could have taken 10 different height measurements in a three meter circle around the peak of Mount Everest, in which case I would conclude the Himalayas are 27,000 feet tall. Or I could have taken three different measurements as I climbed the Himalayas, in which case I would conclude the height of the Himalayas ranges from 3,000 to 20,000, 7,000 feet. And if the variation is large within the class, the class isn't actually a very useful construct, mental construct, because we can't, knowing even lots of empirical evidence about it, without some way of evaluating that evidence against a really specific uh, specification of, you know, uh, <clears throat> unless <laughs> we have ex ante know that we are evaluating exactly the same design in all contexts, you can't aggregate it, right? If I, so, okay. Now, into the same design space. So now, we have some really, I'm building some basics, but we have the notion of a design space. We have the notion of, if I were to implement a project in that design space with fidelity, it would produce the following outcome in terms of some desired outcome. Now I'm gonna introduce same design space Imagine that there is something called the capability of the organization to implement this design with fidelity. Meaning, can your organization do it? 
And it could well be there are things that are high on the technical response surface such that if you could do them, it would produce a lot of outcomes, but you can't do them. Or it could well be, and so this <laughs> and these, uh, one is aware, I mean, all of these are just computer generated images. They have no, like they're just illustrative because after all the underlying like shape of this depends on the mathematics of the ordering of alternatives and there's no, you know. <laughs> So, but you can imagine that this is an organization that can do these things and it can do very little and this is an organization with more capability. It could sort of do whatever you asked it to, in which case if we actually went to implement this project, this particular project design, it would work in this case and not actually be implemented in that case. So, the project wouldn't work not because the technical mapping from outputs to outcomes was causally wrong, but because the organization was incapable of transmitting inputs to activities to outputs. That's what I mean by capability in the log frame. And so recommending that someone do something because it has a high technical response surface output if done when they can't do it is not in fact a sincere and useful recommendation. Right? You could recommend that other people have, you know, learned to run a six minute mile by doing the following exercises. <laughs> Making those recommendations to me would be stupid because I'm 60 years old, I don't run. <laughs> uh, like, you know, I, I'm not going to be able to run a six minute mile no matter what treatment protocol you expose me to. Um, it's not in my capability space, right? Then, <clears throat> moreover, imagine over the same design space there's a political supportability function. Meaning, what is it that I can in fact generate and sustain the political authorization to do? Not saying what the optimal political thing to do, but some designs might be much more politically popular than other designs, right? In which case, some designs, there might be some threshold effect in this, and above some threshold I can do it, but I just can't do these things politically. Even if my organization could do them, that organization can't get political authorization to do it. In which case, actually to increase well-being, a policy program project has to meet the trinity. In case that it's instrumentally correct, such that if I were to do it, it was correct about causal mechanisms that would lead to the outcome, which involves external validity and construct validity. It has to be administratively feasible. It has to be possible for the organization that I am recommending to do it can do it. And it has to be politically supportable. One has to create and sustain a political coalition to authorize the action of the policy program. And if it's not all three, it's not a useful recommendation unless we can move those surface, unless within the surfaces, so we would have to have a recommendation of A, how do I move the surface? Like if I can't do it now, you could say, well, you could build the capability and then do it. But then keep in mind, I would also have to have not just evidence that it would work if I could have the capability to do it, I would also have to have evidence about how to move the capability. And just because I've generated evidence that it would work if you did do it, then that generates the knowledge that I need to be able to do it, but it doesn't generate the knowledge of how I do that. So the upshot of all this <laughs> is that <clears throat> the claim of the RCT 1.0 was the kinds and types of knowledge that can in principle and practice be generated by RC techniques via independent impact evaluations to development project program policies are a key binding constraint on development practice. I mean that the reason we observe the low outcomes we observe are because of the lack of knowledge of the type these can generate. Uh, and again, this is for mathematicians in the audience. Binding constraint means it has a high Lagrangian. And hence, these greater investments in RCTs will lead pari passu naturally to significant higher levels of well-being. But if your key constraint is there's no political interest in improving this. Knowledge of how to improve it if you had the politics doesn't help. If your key constraint is the organization responsible for doing it can't do anything 
Knowledge that if it did something, it would do something good is, again, not particularly important. Um, and so uh, I'm going to, uh, so no, nah, I was going to skip this, but it will, it will change your life if you understand it, so I don't want to <laughs> deprive you of a, <laughs> is what's really amazing uh, about the RCT claim is how incredibly simplistic and marginal on the development process it was. Because this is the kind of rough graphic conceptualization of the project cycle of the World Bank, which is you have a design space of all things you could do within the education space or within the health space. In some design phase, you settle on a single program that you're going to implement, which could have many components, but it's a program. And that's called before. Then you implement, and you monitor during implementation, and you try and track it. And then at the end, you do after, you can examine the outcomes. And the learning was from the feedback loop from the impact evaluation onto the next round of the design phase. This was like the perfectly, completely well understood model that the World Bank had. And like, <laughs> the only thing that RCDs did was reinforce everybody's knowledge that before and after wasn't with and without in order to learn we needed impact with, with and without, not before and after. But the whole idea of learning, the whole idea of the project cycle, the whole idea of the project, the whole idea of everything else about development stayed the same. So, <laughs> whereas uh, one could imagine a radical change in how one thinks about learning in which you don't settle on a single design, in which you design lots of people to do lots of things, in which you have real-time feedback, in which you empower people to take lots of action, in which, say, you create a market in which lots of different providers can provide. You can imagine all kinds of other ways of accelerating a learning process. The first question one has to ask is, is in fact expanding the stock of knowledge about the response surface, how much more would children learn if we did this versus that, really the key constraint to organizational effectiveness? And here I think the, obvious, the answer is just got to be plainly obviously no. And the reason it's plainly obviously no is because there's already lots of variation across countries that can't be explained by those countries having differential access to technical codifiable knowledge about what works. You're shaking your head because you, that wasn't obvious yet. Meaning, if one country is getting 3% of kids reading by grade 6, and another country is getting 97% of kids reading by grade 6, both of them have access to the same body of knowledge as is published in economic journals and other journals about education. The technically codifiable body of knowledge, which is the type of knowledge an RCT can generate, RCTs don't generate tacit knowledge, they don't generate organizational capability, they generate codifiable knowledge. It can't be the case that the variation across countries is explained by variations in codifiable knowledge because the codifiable knowledge body is available to all. So if all countries were doing terrible, then you could argue releasing the knowledge constraint would be important. But if on a piece of scale, India is at 350 and Vietnam is at 500, it strains the imagination to believe that India is at 350 and Vietnam is 500 because they have access to a differential model of technical knowledge about what works. That just can't be true because they can all read the same journals, they can all participate in the same discourse. And so I would argue it's got to be limited by something that's organization and country specific, not knowledge about the response surface. Um, <coughs> and, you know, it, uh, I'm going to give an example that I give it just because it's so fun to give because it's the opposite of what you would ever expect to see in a development seminar, um, which is <laughs> the AK-47 is a really popular weapon around the world. And it's in fact way more popular than the M16. But the M16 on proving ground accuracy is a much more accurate weapon. 
Um, people know enough about guns to know what an AK-47 is, right? Can't not know what an AK-47 is. The M16 is the rifle of weapon of choice of the uh, US military. The AK-47 is what it is. Uh, and then if you ask, <laughs> well, wait a second, why does everybody adopt the AK-47 and not the M16? It's because the Russians and Americans had a very different approach to weapon design. The Americans said, let's design the optimal weapon and train the soldier to the weapon. The Russians said, we're going to have a bunch of illiterate peasants in our army that are essentially untrainable. Let's design a weapon that always works. <laughs> but to design a weapon that always works, it's not very machine precision. It kind of, you slap it together and it fires a bullet. But if you slap it together and it fires a bullet, it's because it's not very machined very precisely, which means it can't fire over long distance very precisely. But the AK-47 is in fact a better weapon because none of the real output of shooting in practice has to do with the accuracy of the weapon. Under combat conditions, nobody hits anything. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody hits anything at 500 yards. Like 500 yards is Lodi's tomb. Like if people are shooting at you, you're never going to hit somebody else at 500 yards away because you're going to be running and ducking for cover, right? So none of the variation in weapon efficacy has to do with the optimal design of the weapon. If we were to say what research is doing, we could say, look, here's performance and here's the difficulty of the task. Um, and we could say there's a global best practice frontier where you get more performance and you kind of and the focus of research is often with people that can in fact do the most difficult thing, how can we get even higher performance, right? Pushing the cutting edge out this way into the space of more difficult tasks but higher performance. The focus of management people is getting organizations from this level to that level the typical service provider in developing countries in ideal conditions in here, and the typical service provider in actual conditions in developing countries is here. In which case, the idea that research about this is the key determinant of performance here is just completely, totally nuts. It, 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 you know. We could move the accuracy of this weapon that direction so you could be more likely to hit things 600 yards away. <laughs> Nobody in actual practice is that anything like the real concern. So Indian schools are operating so incredibly far in the interior of what is known to be possible and efficacious in learning that the idea that Indian schools are constrained in the average level of learning they produce by frontier knowledge of what works in pedagogical practices and in any other dimension is just completely, totally farcical. Okay. Uh, and now I'm just going to illustrate slight, slightly more. So this is, and this isn't India specific, nothing about this is India specific because we get into India, I got a lot of people in the room who know more about India than I do, so let's talk about Africa. <laughs> <laughs> so in Africa, uh, the typical teacher masters the fourth grade curriculum. So if I am talking about what would work to improve teaching in Africa, I have to ask myself, what would it work to improve the teaching of a teacher with fourth grade mastery of the subject matter? Not a Finnish teacher, not a German teacher, not a French teacher, not a Korean teacher, but a teacher that masters the fourth grade curriculum. And by the way, they don't show up. And by the way, even when they show up, they spend very little time on task. So essentially your experience in a school in Africa is that school is in session for five hours a day, five days a week. You actually get about an hour and a half a day of effective instructional time from somebody who has a fourth grade mastery of the curriculum. Second, even, and this is about India, but it's not my study, um, even within India, people don't always, even within an organization, 
The, organ, the individual capacity is often not the key constraint to organizational capability, meaning I'm often not limited in what happens inside the organization by what the individuals in, pra in principle know, but what they do in practice. And this is just a particularly egregious illustration where they compared the exact same doctors in rural Madhya Pradesh in their public sector practice and in their private sector practice. So none of this difference between the standardized checklist score on practice between these doctors can be due to the knowledge of these doctors because they're the same people. But in the public sector clinic they do this because there's low organizational capability to induce the agents to do things. In their private sector practices they do more of what they already know how to do. So most of what we have learned from RCTs is <laughs> that you can't make organizations do stuff. Which of course invalidates the importance of RCTs that reveal what works. So there's a famous study called Ban Putting Band-Aids on a Corpse by the American economist Abhijit Banerjee um, and other co-authors. Um, and it just basically they implemented a kind of whiz-bang treatment to make nurses show up more often. And what happened is nurses showed up significantly less often, even though they were absent significantly less often because they created something called exemption from duty which the district officer could tell, sell to them the price so they all could get paid for being not absent while never being present. So the intervention actually reduced organizational capability because if you pitched up at a clinic expecting to see an auxiliary nurse midwife, they were less likely to be there than in the pre-treatment thing because the organizational capability fell. Uh, an even better example is they did an experiment to try and improve the performance of the police in Rajasthan jointly with uh, the Indian police service officer responsible for the police. Um, <laughs> this is the difference between the treatment and the control group in the treatment. Meaning, <laughs> they couldn't make the police do what the police were supposed to do to investigate whether or not if they did it, it would work. So <laughs> what did we learn? We learned what, that the organization <laughs> didn't have the capability to even do the treatment to find, even under in experimental conditions, to find out if it would work if they did it. Because they just wouldn't do it, even though they were dictated to do it by the appropriate authority and all of that. Basically, <laughs> uh, most people imagine they can make organizations work better by changing the policies of the organization. And I think that's a completely false model and theory of change of how organizations change. So this is project content of the World Bank under whether or not we think there's three elements that kind of introduce how an organization works. One is regulatory content, one is normative content, one is cultural cognitive content. This is kind of normative inside the organization, cultural cognitive. And Kind of people believe that most organizational performance comes here. Here's what World Bank projects consist of, is they change the formal policy. But even if you change the formal policy to an evidence-based formal policy, and this is in fact what changes organizational behavior, you're not going to produce any change. Does the RCT knowledge significantly change the scope of what's politically feasible? Uh, and my answer is no. Uh, Filmer and Pritchett in 1997, which is 22 years ago before really the advent of RCTs, we wrote a paper basically pointing out that the existing evidence, you, that, that if we had a normative model of what a policymaker should be doing if they were maximizing learning, the data rejected that that was a positive model of their actual description. Meaning they weren't trying to do that at all. And yet, so our conclusion is you can't use a positive description of a po as a positive model of policymaker behavior, the assumption that they're maximizing learning subject to buttock constraints. Therefore, you can't use that evidence about that and claim it's a policy recommendation. And this is a really deep but also really simple point. If <laughs> You come to me and you say, I would like to travel to Chennai 
and that's your objective, and I tell you all the different ways you can travel to Jaipur, those are not sincere travel recommendations. I wanted to go to Chennai, and by all of my behavior, I'm realizing I'm, I'm, all of my behavior is consistent with the fact that I want to go to Chennai. Recommendations on how to get to Jaipur, even if it's the optimal way to get to Jaipur, are completely and totally irrelevant. And so, basically, <laughs> this table which is a common JPAL table that aggregates in terms of cost effectiveness per standard deviation per $100 gain is complete and total political nonsense. If in fact policymakers were optimizing, the implication of the theory that they were optimizing is that marginal gain to learning per dollar is equalized and you're showing me a table showing that it's not equalized by factors of a thousand on which you're going to make policy recommendations. Everybody sees that that's like conceptually nuts, right? You've just proven to me that policymakers are not adopting cost effective recommendations, and so I can't use as a positive model of their behavior the fact, the theory that they will adopt cost effective recommendations, and yet my contribution to the public discourse is recommending cost-effective interventions. Your own evidence just rejected the model on which you're using as a model to make recommendations. So unless you actually have a positive theory of political economy, you can't call what you're doing making recommendations. And the amazing thing about this table, and by the way, this table is exactly the evidence from Fillmore Pritchett 1997. It says exactly the same thing, which is that marginal product per dollar isn't equalized by orders and orders of magnitude, from which Filmer and Pritchett conclude the only concludable thing from an economist's point of view, which is that the policymaker is not attempting to optimize. 20 years later, economists produce the same table and conclude that this table is the basis for making politically relevant recommendations. That's an enormous intellectual retrogression. Like they're 22 years behind us. Because one of these bars is infinity. The cost effectiveness of contract teachers in Kenya is infinity. Because you get more learning paying teachers less. Okay. Now if my theory is you were trying to maximize learning for budget, you should never be in the position of doing things that are infinitely cost ineffective. We're not doing things that are infinitely cost effective. So the fact that you have found that means recommending that you do contract teachers <coughs> is logically inconsistent because they wouldn't be doing it if in fact they had the object, if they wanted to go where you think they want to go and you're making them recommendations for. So what happened when <laughs> they actually tried to scale up contract teachers well, when they did it with an NGO implementation, it actually reproduced the experimental result. But when the government did the implementation of the exact program that was supposedly infinitely cost effective, it had zero impact on learning. And generated strikes, and generated court cases, and completely froze up the ministry from doing anything else. So it wasn't in the political feasible space to do contract teachers however cost effective it might be. So um, <clears throat> then I'm going to skip a whole bunch of stuff basically saying that trying to aggregate stuff that it doesn't have construct validity is just dumb and trying to aggregate stuff that doesn't have external validity is just dumb and it's worse than that. So this for instance is a standard review of the literature that shows the average impact of computers or technology interventions is 0.15 effect sizes. The average impact of additional instructional materials is 0.081 sizes. And therefore concludes that on average policymakers should look for computers or technology interventions. But <clears throat> this is the treatment effect of doing one of those, this average, in the average is this intervention which has a negative 0.6 impact and this intervention, which has a 0.3 positive impact, done in exactly the same experiment. 
These are two different points in the design space in the same context. So the ruggedness of the design space is a standard deviation, large, in a space in which you're making recommendation between classes of programs based on 0.1 standard deviation differences. Again, the answer is do this, not that. Not that we have reliable information on this, not that. Final, there's this graph, which is just unbelievably powerful because it's worse than that there's a lack of external validity. It's that there's, there can't be external validity. Why do I say that? Why I say that is, suppose we've done a bunch of observational studies and we know the observational impact of class size. And then some smart aleck comes along and says, oh, well, you know, people self-select into class size, so the, tr the true causal impact of class size isn't identified from observational data. We need to do an experiment, and they do an experiment, okay? And let's say whatever experiment they do, this is the original distribution. Uh, this is the original distribution of where we thought our original prior of the, dis the original observed distribution was this kind of large heterogeneity and class size impacts. We do a RCT and we have a very precise estimate of the impact. Okay? Ask yourself, what do you do, suppose you're Bayesian prior, and Bayesian prior in the completely casual sense that you don't need to know what Bayesian prior means to answer this question. You have a distribution of heterogeneous effects and I don't know which one of them applies to me, but I know they're mean and they're standard error. How should your belief about where you are be changed by the concrete number of the impact evaluation? Well, suppose kind of without loss of generality, the treatment effect is higher <laughs> than the mean, right? Um, then you say, oh, well now I know the rigorous evidence says the impact is bigger than I thought the observational data says. Right? But then the problem is <laughs> that's one set of parameters that generated one set of evidence, but the bias in the observational data is itself the result of another set of parameters. Okay? Which of those set of parameters has external validity? Well, if they both have external validity, then you have to reproduce exactly the observational data if you move your prior towards the impact effect, it means you're moving your estimate of the bias of the observational relative to the ICD in different directions. Which means there can't be external validity of the bias. But both of these are parameters about the world. So you can't possibly believe that the world organized itself such that whatever you declared your experiment was about happened to have external validity, and the rest of the world happened to have the parameters that what made it possible to reconcile the existing observational data with your particular parameter. And now I realize I've lost you completely. <laughs> yeah, and I'm wrapping up. So let me wrap up there because I've lost you completely. But the point is, the idea that one can take a variety of RCTs and do a systematic review and say anything useful is completely, it, it's not just wrong, it's logically incoherent. You can't formulate a, logical, a logically coherent way that says relative to what you believed about the world, here is how you should change your beliefs about the world in response to a piece of RCT evidence because you would have to change your priors in different directions. And that just means it's logically incoherent. One way says up, one way says down, and there's no way of saying on the basis of the RCT evidence which way, whether you should go up or down. Thank you very much.